All right, here we go. Let's from the beginning. All right, buddy. On today's episode, we talk with Ashley. And I'm not going to tell you what we're going to talk about. Ashley, what do we talk about today? Farting and darting. Farting and darting. <laughs> Stop letting blind people proofread your vision. Is it a fact, a feeling, or a fart? And what else did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was all. <laughs> I'll add to it and say that the content in today's episode with this amazing human being single-handedly can transform and move the needle for anyone's business who uses social media, email, or any other marketing modality that you advertise to your customers. So I can't do it justice or service as well as she does explaining, but it is loaded with gems and I took a lot of notes. So Ash, thanks for being on the episode. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. Awesome. So now that you know that and you know who's on the episode, it's time to go listen. So let's cue the intro. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George Show. Uh, This one is a fun one. This is uh, my sister probably separated at birth coming to you from the big comfy chair in Montana. And this is my first interview in the big comfy chair. And so I'm actually really excited because I got a cup of coffee, a sheepskin rug behind me, the view of Glacier National Park Mountains in a very sunny day. And I had to move the office because it is so bright because of the sun and the snow. I'm getting my vitamin D and cold therapy at the same time. But I'm really excited. I've been overdue for this podcast because we normally have these conversations on Voxer or actually very inefficiently on Facebook Messenger with one minute audio messages that make it extremely hard (laughs) to listen. But Ashley Fernandez is here today, who is the absolute queen of writing belief shifting content, standing in her power, holding tight containers and closing high ticket deals in the DMs like it's nobody's business, but she's a business boss. And so today we're going to have the challenge of who has the slower internet while recording a podcast and delivering as much value as possible. So Ashley, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And it was very long. It was, (laughs) it was. I feel like, I feel like we have podcast conversations like almost every single day and we just haven't been intentional about putting it into a quote unquote podcast. I know. If people could listen to our Facebook messengers, um, they would literally get gold, right? They would get gold. So I'm so glad that we're actually recording it now. I know. They should. They could listen because they could join the mastermind, but we'll save that for another day. We'll leave leave that. Ashley Ashley is a member of the mastermind family. She's going to end up, you know, being like an OG and we got 20 years of work left to change the world. And so I'm super, super stoked on this. So I want to unpack this because this episode is about you. And before I ask you this question, um, I want to share this with everybody. Ashley has been pivotal in shifting my brain around content, around messaging, and around connecting with my customers. And I'm going to frame this up before I ask this question because very rarely do I come across somebody who shows up with such power, such grace and such intelligence that like literally pattern interrupts my life and then makes things make sense to me. And so I've been working on messaging and social media and emails and stuff for like 10 years and and it's worked. It's worked very, very, very well, but there's levels to this game. And Ashley came in and helped me find levels and helped me build the bridge between where I was, but where I needed to be in order to connect with my customers. And so my heart was in the right place. My head was in the right place. And even what I was doing was in the right place, but there were just a couple tiny, and I mean tiny micro adjustments that were needed to make it effective. And it's been absolutely amazing. And my paradigm is kind of like blown up around this. So I'm opening that loop because I know we're going to talk about it today. And so everybody stick around, but I got to kick off with the same question that I ask everybody, because I feel like you have a couple nuggets here and you can unpack it as far as you want. But when you look back at your career as an entrepreneur, which by the way, something I forgot in the intro is she's also a super mom. How old is the baby now? 
Um, I have a three-year-old and a three-month-old. Three and three. Yep. So three-year-old and a three-month-old. And you would never know because she had a baby and didn't miss a beat in the mastermind. I was like, what are you doing? Like, you make me feel <laughs> like I am so bad at work <laughs> and so inefficient because you are like a rock star. And so you have a lot of experience, right? You work on balance. You live in the boonies of North Carolina with slow internet, but you have you and your husband work from home. You have the two kids. You've been in business and you've grown a lot through your business. So as you look back as your career, quote unquote, as an entrepreneur, like what was the biggest quote unquote, I said that like seven times, I'm done. I'm not saying that again. What was the biggest mistake <laughs> or lesson or biggest mistake? And then the lesson that you learned from that, that you kind of carry forward in everything that you do now. Mm, this is actually a very easy one. And I know like someone else is probably, or you probably hear this quite often, but it was my biggest mistake was listening to everybody else and letting blind people proofread my vision. I say mm. that all the time. Stop letting blind people proofread your vision. And what I mean by that is going and asking your best friend and your mama and your husband and everything else about what you want to do in business and also just paying attention to like everyone around you, right? Instead of actually focusing on your vision and your calling and what you really honestly want to do um, and getting super, super clear on you. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Right. And so that's what I say. I say that to everybody, because if someone comes to me and they're like, well, I saw so-and-so doing this. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I kind of want to do that too. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Like, is that part of your vision? You know, like, is that part of your vision? So that was my biggest mistake was letting everyone and anyone really come in and influence my vision. Basically blind people proofreading my vision. I, and the way that I go ahead. I got to say, I've never, I want you to keep going, but I've never heard you say that before. Like that is the tweetable of 2021. No, really? No, I'm like, I'm like that. sitting over here. Like you're dropping like stoicism wisdom. Like that's going to be published in a book. That should probably be the title of your oh, book. Yeah. I should be the said, stop letting blind people prove your vision. Yeah. Um, yeah, it should be a title, right? Yeah. But it's, it's something I say all the time. I say it a lot to my clients because in marketing, as a marketing strategy, doing all the next best things. And again, you preach all the time, containers, containers, containers. And one of the biggest containers I think we need to have is who we listen to, who we follow, who we pay attention to, who we actually let into the heart of our business and our vision. And so I even actually, that was like, I guess my biggest achievement after I figured out that mistake was really finding one or two key people to pay attention to, to learn from, and actually not just pay attention blindly, right? Like in the background, but actually get to know them and really trust who was giving me counsel and wisdom, right? So you know, you were absolutely one of those people. Um, another person is my, one of my coaches, Cam Snow. He was another person that came in and, you know, it's someone who has the same values as me, who doesn't BS people, right? Like that's a big thing. Like you don't want people to BS people, right? So really just finding those, those two, maybe two to three core people in, and actually in different areas of your life, not only business, you know, my husband and I have um, a couple that we, that we mentor with, right? Like we have an older couple who disciples us in our marriage. And so if there's anything going on in my marriage, she's the person that I talk to. And so just finding core people in different areas of your life, right? Um, and who to pay attention to and really focusing on that and not letting again, blind people proofread your vision. Okay. So uh, that's going on a t-shirt, right? I got it. I literally whipped out my iPad. If, the, if you guys aren't watching this, and you're listening to this, like she's talking and I whipped out my iPad so I could start taking notes because I'm like, I haven't heard any of this. This is like fresh gold. I'm going to interview you more for part two <laughs> and three so I can extract. I have to say some good things. Yeah. I got, it's I probably because I, it's probably because I talk too much when we're in engagement and so you don't get it out. So I'm going to just create space for you to get it out. So I love this. Stop letting blind people proofread your vision. And I want to unpack it because one of the things that you said was you're really protective and intentional about who you get feedback from. And so 
I know personally that this is something that's shown up in my life a few times and a few other people that I've mentored and coached. And so, of course, having sound counsel helps. But also, I think one of the things that I've realized, and I'd love your thoughts on this and and kind of unpacking it however you would, is that even the, the, the other thread that you talked about of like paying attention to what everybody else is doing, right? Like every one of those moments, paying attention to what they're doing and letting blind people proofread your vision actually all is counterintuitive because it's preventing you from creating your vision. And so yep. how do you mitigate that? Like, what do you do? How do you manage that? Like, what's some of the advice that you can give to protect that and to keep those containers tight? Yeah. So for me, um, it has been a lot of not really scrolling on social media, being very intentional about um, who I pay attention to on social media. Right. And so I also um, my mentors, like in George, I've even asked you, like, George, who are some people I should be paying attention to? Like I ask those my mentors, who do you think I should be paying attention to? Because, again, you know, my business, you know, my heart, you know, kind of my blind spots, right? So that you can see. Um, And so sometimes I always kind of like, that's kind of also how I connect with other people of like, George, who do you recommend that I follow if I'm looking for this? Or, um, you know, asking those advice. And those are the kind of people that I only pay attention to. So not really scrolling on social media is a big one. Um, And another one is if I do happen to come across someone, um, I have a really, really, really big gift of discernment. Um, I'm just one of those people that can immediately tell in my gut if someone's genuine or not. Um, And so for me, what actually catches my eye, if I do happen to be scrolling or if I do happen to come across someone that I haven't come across from, I'll listen to them just for a couple minutes. And I honestly just listen to my gut. And I'm kind of like, "Mm, is this person doing this to seek approval or are they doing it to actually serve, right? And that's something that I've said before to you as well, is that like um, a, lot of the t- a lot of the times people show up to seek approval instead of really showing up to serve. And you can kind of tell with what they talk about, how, they're, um, how they show up and how they help, right? And so I kind of just listen to them for a few minutes and I can tell really quickly, like if they're, if they're just, dis- if they're dishonest or not really genuine, if they're coming from a different place. And that's just me personally. I just kind of have that gift. I have a really big BS eater, um, <laughs> like a really strong one. But yeah, that is another question to how they communicate with their audience. If it's someone who I call it farting and darting, and I know that's like really <laughs> funny, but if they pop something in a Facebook group, and then skedaddle and then people are commenting and they never come back and and, and interact with those people or engage with those people. Like that to me just shows that you're really just showing up to seek approval. You're not showing up to actually serve, right? And I also think that this, and I'll just say this was something that I struggled with for a while when I first got in my business, because again, I was following all these other people who were like, make sure you're showing up everywhere and doing all the things and doing this, right? And so I, my heart really wanted to serve, but I was just putting so much on my plate to where I actually couldn't serve. I, it became a, here's me, look what I'm doing. I'm here for, like to show up, you know, type things. So it was like I was going in a room farting and then like running before anyone could like be left the horrible sign. So I was like farting and darting. Um, and so when I got really close with my containers and I started really paying attention, um, and really simplifying where I was showing up to serve, uh, that got a lot easier, but Mm. I guess I kind of like went in a circle, but those, those were some of the things I did. So I pay attention when I come across someone, I look at really how they're serving others. And if they are, um, really there to, to build relationships and actually help. Um, and another thing, I'll just add this one last thing that, that when I started, when I felt I was doing this, one of the things that, I realize as we'll, we'll talk about belief shifting content is that in my own belief, I thought when I showed up, the people in my space also, I wanted them to act a certain way. I wanted, I had these, I had these unrealistic expectations on them. And then if they didn't show up the way that I wanted them to show up, I would get resentful. I would get angry. And then it made me show up when I did show up, it made me show up kind of aggressive because I was kind of, angry and irritated of like, why am I going to spend all my time creating this value for you? And you're not even going to show up and implement it or take it. And, 
I had to take a step back and realize that my own thought was wrong, right? Like my own thought was that I was there to seek approval and I wanted them to act a certain way. And really at the end of the day, I had to change my thought to they're asking me for help and oh my gosh, what a privilege it is to help them. Whether they take the help or not, what a freaking privilege that I get to be the person they're asking for help. Like that's amazing, right? Like that makes me feel really good that these people are coming to me and asking me for help. Um, Mm -hmm. And I had to be okay. Like the actions of whether they took it or not had nothing to do with me actually showing up and serving, right? Like I'm the only one who could have control over that. So I kind of had to change my my thought around that. Um, But you can clearly see this on the online space. Like you can clearly see the people who show up to seek approval instead of actually to serve. Like you can really tell if you pay attention. Yeah. The timing of this conversation, Ashley, and we'll have to address this in a podcast like five years from now, once the time has passed, <laughs> but, 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 but you and I are, yeah. we, we live in the, we live in this world, right? There's so many things that you said that I, I want to unpack. And, and, and something came to me and you said, you said this and you said being in all the places, right? Like, Oh, I want to be in all the places and do all the things. And I just wrote this cause it came out. And I said, omnipresence doesn't work without depth or at the sacrifice of yourself. And it, mm-hmm. it's, it's this thing that I, I hear you talking about, like you're talking about, you know, belief shifting, you're talking about unspoken expectations. You're talking about the difference between like gratitude and expectation. Like there's so many things in there to unpack. But the last thing that you said, I think is so, so powerful. And I have a question because this is something that I've definitely worked on and I still work on to this day. And I'll share it right now. When you said, right in that moment, you said, like, how amazing, like, how awesome is it that I get to help them? Like, how awesome is it that I get to help them? Well, you're in my mastermind and you're somebody that I care about deeply. And you said that. And in that moment, it made me feel so amazing and humble and grateful. And at the same time, realizing that there's also a lot of pockets in my day where I and my own beliefs get in the way of creating results for myself and for other people. And so can you talk us through that? Because I think that's something that I don't hear talked about often. And I know it's something you and I talk about often and everybody else, but the, the difference between creating content or showing up to be of actual absolute service versus manipulation mass disservice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can totally talk about that. And I feel, you know, a lot of people aren't really aware of it. Like sometimes they do fall. Like when you first, be, when you're first in entrepreneurship, a lot of people fall into that kind of manipulation masked as serving. And I know I certainly did. I'm definitely not like over here saying, woe is me, but me, yeah, me too, was, me too, me too. That's why we're yeah, talking about it. Do. Yeah. I think it's a rite of passage. <laughs> I think it's a rite of passage as an entrepreneur. But yeah, but what I realized, and you know, this is actually um, when George says, I help people create belief shifting content. Um, this is actually what I do. So when For me personally, when I started really working on my mind and overcoming my like limiting beliefs and really understanding how I operate and like what my thoughts are, um, when I started doing this for myself, I realized how transformational it was. And then I started to realize like, man, this is actually missing in the marketplace. And so I'll I'll come back to that loop, um, but just kind of I guess, prefacing like how I actually started doing what I'm doing and why my content is so different and works so well. Um, so the way that most people operate, and I've, I've told, I've explained this to you several times, George, is that uh, this model was, is not my own. It was created by a life coach um, named Brooke Castillo. And it actually isn't like her whole thought or whatever, but the way that she structured it makes a lot of sense. Um, this is also taught in like CBT, like Uh, therapy. So basically her whole thing is uh, that an event or circumstance will happen and it's neutral. Like everything is neutral until you have a thought about it. And then that thought will cause you to feel a certain way. And then because you feel a certain way, you're going to take certain actions, right? And then those actions are going to drive the results. And that is how everything works. If you look at the results you're making right now, if you're making results you don't want to make, 
you, if you look at the thoughts that you're having about it and you put it in this model, you're going to understand why you're getting the results you're getting. And a lot of people don't quite understand this. They actually work in a different type of model. They will have a circumstance and then they'll do something and like, let's say the circumstances is raining outside, right? A circumstance is a fact. You can't change it. It's raining outside. Me, I will immediately have like a feeling about it, right? Like a lot of people go straight to the feeling. So let's say it's raining outside. My feeling is, oh my gosh, I feel so amazing because I love, I personally love rainy days. I'm so productive on rainy days Me too. because it doesn't make me feel bad to be outside. <laughs> like I can't go out and do anything. I can be inside and I can be super pro productive, right? So I would have feeling. And then a lot of people operate as the circumstance or the event that happens and they have a feeling about it. And then because they have a feeling, they'll take certain actions and then those actions will cause a result. And then only when they get the result is when they'll have a thought about it. That's how almost everyone thinks they operate, but it's not right. So what happens if the result is wrong, what they're going to try to do is always go back to the actions. They're like, I can just change the actions. I can change the actions and I'll get a different result. But that's not true because if you always think, I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. No matter what actions you do, you're never, ever, ever going to get the results you want because you're always going to be taking actions from a place of I'm not good enough. Right. And so when I started to realize that this is how actually the marketplace, most copywriters, most messaging experts, most marketers operate in the same part. That's the F A R two, the C fart, and that's not how it actually operates. It operates in the C T F A R. So if you ever want a different result, you're going to go to your thought about it. So for me, I started journaling every single morning about this, and I wrote down all of my feelings. I'm like, how am I feeling? What is going on? Right? Like, then I would say, okay, what thoughts am I having because I feel this way? Let's say I feel anxious. And maybe I don't know why I'm anxious, right? And then I'll th my thought is, well, I'm not going to be able to get anything done today because I'm feeling anxious. So then my action is I'm not going to do anything today. And then my result is I didn't get anything done that I wanted to get done today, right? So I literally proved my thought right. I'm going to prove my thought right. And this is what I also hate, like positive affirmations and different things like that, because you can say something all day long but if you don't actually believe it, it's never going to change for you. Do you actually, I was on a call on a, on, I think it was an eternal, no, it was an email call. You just did a random email call one time and you shared a story with us um, that was so pivotal to me. And that is when the light bulb went off and I knew that I had already done this in my messaging. But then when you shared that story, I was like, <gasps> that's exactly what I do. That's exactly how I could do it. And I started to kind of like actually put it in an actual process of what I did. Um, and I'm not even going to share that story because it's too good. I think you you should share it another time and then blow people away with it. But you're going to have to remind story, me what the story is. Cause I don't remember what the story is. Um, the last day on earth. Oh, yep. 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 Got it. The last day on earth story. And so that like when that shifted me and I was like, yes, this is exactly how we need to operate in the world. Like this is how we need to, operate with our clients. We need to do this. Right. And so I kind of realized that I was operating in a C fart method instead of actually a CTFAR. That's when I realized that that method, I was basically trying to make decisions. I even wrote this down. I was trying to make decisions because I thought the emotion was going to come from the decision that I made. It was going to come from the actions that I made, but really it comes from the thought. Um, and so I say all of this because I realized that when I worked in the C fart method, I was always trying to put my thoughts, my beliefs into someone else's model. Mm. Like I was trying to say, well, I feel like I'm hardworking and I'm showing up in all this value. And if they don't take it, then that means something about them. And that making that mean something about me, mm. right? So when I had a thought, let's say I had a group coaching program and I didn't sell but four spots and I wanted to sell six, right? 
And I'm frustrated because I'm like, these people don't understand how much value this is. Like they need to be buying this. It's so good. Right. So then I would get frustrated. And I remember my coach literally said to me, what are you making them not buying your, your program mean about you? And I was like, Oh God. And it was, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Complete lie. Right. That I'm actually, it was, I'm not worth investing in. And it was funny because she said, pay attention that you said, I'm not worth investing in, not that your service is not worth investing in. And I was like, oh gosh, like it was a hard pill to swallow, right? But because I was having those thoughts, I was putting my worth into someone else's hands. And the way that I measured my worth was if they bought my service or not. Mm -hmm. because I thought my service was a part of me. So I was literally saying, I'm not worth investing in instead of my offer is not worth investing in. And then when I literally changed that thought, because I know that wasn't true, I'd already had four people sign up for it. I've had over 50 plus clients I've ever worked with. And I'm like, I know this is worth investing in. I get amazing results for these people, right? Like my process is amazing. When I actually realized that it was like, oh, okay. And so I completely changed my thought about it. And then no joke, like, probably within 24 hours, I filled those last two spots. Mm. Now, did you change the thought or did yeah. you change the belief? I changed the thought. So okay. thoughts are kind of like thoughts and beliefs are almost in the same category. Right. But a belief is something belief to me is when you have the thought over and over and over again, and it becomes kind of ingrained in your memory. Yep. So you have to be aware of the thought before you can change the belief. If that uh, makes sense. No, that makes, um, that, that makes perfect sense. Time. Yeah, I, actually, yeah. Um, you know, uh, my buddy Jim Quick's coming on the podcast soon, and, and he's the master of this, talking about like your brain is your supercomputer, mm -hmm. right? And the thoughts that yeah. you have every day are writing the program of that computer. And so when you're repeatedly thinking over and over and over again, I'm not good enough, I'm not worth investing in, it becomes a belief. And then I, I think you said something very, very important that I want to unpack with you because we can unpack this. And I don't think a lot of people think about this, that- when we have those beliefs, no matter what, when we're writing that content or doing that video, we pass energetically that belief off to the people that are receiving it. And people will say like, I wanted to invest, but I just didn't feel good enough or I didn't feel like I was ready. And this might sound woo woo and esoteric, but it, it's so true because sales is just a transference of energy as my good friend Kayvon says. And our energy has to say it. And you've heard me like a broken record. By the way, you're obsessed with farting, Ashley, just in case you haven't caught that yet. Like see fart, <laughs> farting and darting, like got it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Nailed it. Right. So we might have to make, so funny. <laughs> but we might have to make like the fart method so we can turn it into something and then have a good, like we can come up with one, Ashley. This might be like our work together is coming up with the fart method for some sort of after state, but I, I think we talk about this. I've said this for years, like nobody has a marketing problem. Everybody has a relationship problem with themselves, their team and their customers, because what you're really talking about here is you're talking about how to write belief shifting content that makes money, but you have to believe it and shift yourself. You have to be in alignment with what you actually believe. And this is something that I love extensively about you and what you write. And it, it's not even like a tactic of like, oh, I'm being authentic or whatever. It's like, I'm actually just sharing what I believe. And like you said, you're mm -hmm. like, I don't like affirmations. And some people be like, oh, and I'm like, I use affirmations. I say thoughts all the time, but like, you're so congruent and so on with what you say that that belief creates credibility. And then when you go write these things and you're doing these posts or doing these via DM, like you are a hundred percent trustworthy. You are a hundred percent aligned. And you are showing up and it's magnetic because you're just being there. And, and what I think is so powerful is that what you're basically doing is like, this is who I am. Like, this is the belief I have. This is what I experience, And this is mine. If you resonate with this belief, then you can come into me and we'll help work together. Right. But it's not like, even if you disagree, get away from me. It's like, you're just like, this is who I am. This is what works. This is how I work. And so when you think about this, like, do you ever, I don't want to use the word struggle, but like what, what gets in the way sometimes or what comes up for you? Because we share, you and I both share past stuff. We share story stuff. Like how do you take your beliefs and package them in a way 
that are advantageous for you and your customer and not almost like martyry or heavy or, you know, mm-hmm. like how, what's your process for that to make sure that it's serving you and it's also serving your customer? Yeah. So this is actually kind of the whole structure of how I create my content is I just help the person who I'm talking to see that they actually have the same belief, but it might be said a different way. And so earlier when I said, okay, thoughts are something you have over, over belief. I want to add something else to that. Thoughts are something that we are aware of. A belief is something we have subconsciously. Totally. We have to take a little bit of digging into the thoughts that we're having to get to the root belief, right? Mm -hmm. Because I could think my program's not great or, you know, but the true belief of that is like, I don't think I'm good enough, right? Mm -hmm. If I were really digging, if you kept asking me why and I was digging and digging and digging, the belief that I'd have there is I'm not good enough. And then that's when I have to stop and be like, oh, wow, is that a fact or a feeling? That's something I say all the time too, is it a fact or a feeling? So a lot of the times I realize that a lot of us have the same beliefs. It's just our thoughts are are kind of worded a little bit different, right? And so for me, I can be talking to somebody and I can, I've gotten so good at it now. And my husband gets mad. He's like, stop coaching me. Like when he says things, (laughs) I'm like, oh, let's, let's talk about that. You just said it, right? So let's just say something, let's say, for example, I was on a call with um, one of my friends the other day and she was really confused about her offer. And she was like, I know I'm just so complicated. And I stopped her and I said, no, you're not. That's a belief that you have. And she didn't even realize it, right? Like, and I said, if you really truly think you're complicated, how is that showing up in your business? How is that showing up in your life, right? And then she, she would be like, well, I feel like I'm hesitating on actually taking action. I'm like, and then what do you think about that? She goes, well, it makes me think I'm not ready. So it's like, you can literally dig into these things. Like if they have an I am and they say something, that is a belief that they have. And then when we start to kind of unpack it a little bit, we can start to dig into the thoughts of why they have that belief. And so for me, um, one, I pay attention to what I'm saying, like what I think is you know, another one like that you actually called out on me and sometimes it takes other people <laughs> to see it. I used to say, oh, I just tell it like it is. I'm a, I'm a hard truth person, right? Like I just tell it like it is. <laughs> but really, you know, that was a belief that I had. And when I dug into like, well, how does that belief make me feel? You know, and I really started thinking like, what do I think about that? Why do I think that? I realized I was actually scared of being vulnerable. So I was using that as a mask of not being vulnerable, right? Because I thought vulnerability was weak. So I had the belief that being vulnerable was weak and it manifested and came out as me being a, I'm a tell it like it is type of person. And I was having that as an identity. So sometimes you just have to go through and like dig into the roots of different things. Um, But that's truly what I do. And so a lot of the times people who come in my space when I talk the way that I do, when I say, I don't like affirmations, I will always explain why, right? And it's not that I don't think affirmations are bad. They're not, they're great. Like they're positive, that's great. But a lot of people don't use them the right way. They will just say it over and over and over again, but they don't truly believe it. They haven't got rid of the belief, the negative belief they have that allows them to really understand the affirmation, right? So you have to dig through the root. It's just kind of like, like I don't know. Uh, I don't even remember who it was. You said like putting lipstick on a podcast. It's like putting lipstick on, you know, your soul, basically your, your thoughts. It's putting lipstick on it and calling it something else, right? Um, and you have to understand those things. And sometimes it does take someone coming in and seeing it for yourself, obviously, because sometimes you don't realize it. And like my friend, she was, and I'll even do like Ashley DeLuca, right? In our mastermind, um, we both love her so much. She used to say, I just need to do all the things. I'm doing oh, all the things. I just need to do all the things. And I, she just did it as like a fun catchphrase, right? But then when we, I was like, Ashley, with, by you saying that, you're truly believing that you have to do all the things. Mm-hmm. And when you believe you mm-hmm. have to do all the things, why do you feel like you have to do all the things? And for her, when we were digging through it and digging through it, her thought was, no one's going to think I'm an authority 
unless I'm doing all of the things. Mm -hmm. So then when we dug in a little bit further, she was thinking, I'm not good enough. It went straight down to that belief of I'm not good enough, right? I have to be doing more, more, more. And she didn't even realize that she was doing it as like a fun catchphrase. And I was like, caught her in. And I was like, we need to change that belief. Like we need to really get out of this identity of I have to be doing all of the things. So you can catch it in everyday conversation, right? You can catch it when they're saying something. If they say like an I am, you know, I am this or like putting a label or an identity on themselves that's maybe a negative way. Um, and sometimes it's not even a positive way. Sometimes you can be like, oh, I'm hilarious. Well, why do you feel you have to be hilarious? Is there something, is there a reason why you feel like you have to be hilarious, right? Like, again, that might be a silly example, but really yeah. digging into the motives. That's another word, a great word. The motives as to why yeah. you're doing certain things or why you believe you are a certain way. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, that, I don't no, no, that, that's question. great. I think, I think it's great. I, rem I remember, Ashley DeLuca, we love you. Um, we <laughs> both attacked that belief at like the same time <laughs> because we were both like, yeah. Yeah. and then she had we her, were best both at like, <laughs> she, we were playing good cop, bad cop, mommy, daddy. And we were like, we got you just go to avocados and turtles. But we did. Um, I, I think one yeah. of the things that I want to highlight with what you just said, and I think it's important is what, what you're talking about is bringing awareness to the subconscious, bringing awareness to the beliefs. But I want to presence that there's nothing you're not changing anything. Awareness is the secret, right? So it's like asking like, why do I want to be hilarious? Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with being it, but when you can get to the root yeah. cause, you're aware and you're aligned of the program that's running that allows you to be congruent and to be deep and to be consistent and really an integrity at like that deep level. And so there's like three loops I have to close. One earlier, you were talking about something online and, and I don't even remember what it was, but the basically undertow was patience, right? I think, oh, we were talking about how people show up, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do we stop being distracted and how do we stop consuming people's content and things like that? And, and what you said was like, oh, you observe. But what, what you had underneath it was you had a, a game of patience, right? It wasn't like, oh, this showed up. Let me act on it. You're like, wait, I see you. Mm -hmm. Let me schedule you in my calendar for seven days from now and revisit that thought. Like I do that, right? When like, I've been working yeah. on this for the last six months. It's like, I'm an impulse type of person, right? Like I want to go buy trucks and guns and all the things and build a lighthouse in the middle of Montana. Like I really want to do these things, right? And so I've been doing this and I'm like, okay, I got it. Or it's like, hey, I want to do that thing or I want to launch that program or so-and-so is doing it. And so if it comes up, I give it a container. I put it in my calendar for like seven to 30 days in the future. And then I go back to your world, mm -hmm. to building my vision. And then I revisit it. So I have patience, right? I have space for it to come up. And it's mm -hmm. really, really powerful because it removes the, the impulse feeling and allows me to really marinate on it and see what all the ingredients are to make an informed decision. And so I absolutely love that. And then what you were talking about a minute ago, which by the way, I had, I have to tell you this, I wrote this down when you said factor feeling, I think we have another mm -hmm. tagline that says, is it a fact of feeling or a fart? And we have to figure out what the fart <laughs> is. We really have to figure out yes. what the fart you is. Have to do that. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh man, you're going to, oh, maybe, maybe that's what you should name your show. Um, I can't get Gosh, off of this. Me and Angie Lee, I feel like me and Angie Lee are going to have to do something around it because she's always about poop. I know. And now I'm doing farts. We're going to have to do something. I know. And <laughs> I actually... I actually fly to her house tomorrow and we're recording a podcast. I'm going to have to like present this and be like, okay, listen, listen. You have to do a fart and dart video. <laughs> a, fart, a, fart, a fart and dart well, video. Actually, I'm going to actually give you the backstory of that. It's super funny. Um, when I was a waitress um, in college at Olive Garden, I worked with this guy that was so like, his personality was so loud, so loud. And we were at the drink station and he was like, this table is so rude to me. They are being awful and needy. And he was like, you know what? I just farted and darted. And I was like, you what? He was like, I took their order, farted and walked away. And I started dying laughing. So it became this like this thing at, at the Olive Garden that if you had a bad table, it was like, oh yeah, you just farted and darted or whatever. Or if someone like ate really quick and left. So it was like this phrase that we used 
And I was like, man, it's so great. It's always stuck with me because I'm like, man, it really is. It's like you show up in the room, you fart, and then you run, right? And then you're like, everyone's at the table, like awkwardly being like, who did it? Like, what was that smell, right? And they don't think it was you because you walked away. So anyways, it's that's that's where the story came from. And I remember that being the most hilarious thing ever. That he was like, yeah, I farted and darted. Unlimited breadsticks and a drive-by with a pissed off waiter. I, I <laughs> love it, right? Yeah, that's... <laughs> That sounds great. All of guarded employees just farting and darting when they get angry. Yeah. I mean, I would take that over somebody spitting in my food, though. But at least if somebody exactly. spit in my food, I didn't know. Right. So I was yeah. like, uh, I don't know. I don't remember. OK. And then I'm glad you told that story because my brain couldn't remember the third loop that I opened in my own head. And I didn't even tell you. But uh-huh. I remember. And, and what you're talking about here is is thought. You're talking about intention. You're talking about depth. Right. And a lot of what you do is you post this content, like this belief shift and content online. Um, you post it on your, you know, your feed, on your platforms, and then people DM you and, and, and pay a lot of money just because they feel seen and heard and respected. But what I, what I want to tie two things together is like being in all the places, right, is you can't. You, you have to go with depth. And, you know, you don't go post 17 times a day. You're like, no, if I post, I'm going to post something that has depth, that has meaning, that that takes somebody on a journey when they choose to do it. And also being unattached to whether they take the journey or not. And so I just wanted to give you kudos for that and highlight that because I've fallen into this before too, right? Like when, when you're teaching marketing and you're doing all the things, like I get anxiety all the time. I'm like, man, I'm doing three podcasts a week and boom, boom, boom. And I was like, I want them in all the places. And I was like, ah, oh, I can't say I want them in all the places and then tell my team that I want everything to transform somebody's life or feels like that when they see it. And so these things come up yeah. all the time. And I think it's really important to talk about them and, and presence them. And, um, You know, I would love to kind of hear, so uh, CTFAR, circumstance, thought, feeling, action, result, right? I would love because I think everybody is probably at the edge of their seat or like, okay, lady, what are you doing? You've opened loops right now. So can you like walk through kind of like one, like walk through a Facebook post, like, and we can pick anything. We can either do it randomly or we can do a real world example. You can use me, you can use you, we can do whatever, but I would love, and even if you want to read one, like here's here, yeah. you know what? You know what? The one that got me and I was like, I got oh, it. I know exactly the one you're about to say. I'm about to pull it up. That's not that very Christian, Christian of me. Yes, and, I'm about to get it. And I was like, girl, I was like, what is that? And I was on the edge of my seat, Ashley. Like, I don't read, like, I listen to books because like I have like ADD yeah. of like 28 squirrels, right? Like I I don't know. Was that what was that movie? Was it Funny Nemo? It was like uh, with the Funny with the birds Dory. in the water. Mine, 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 mine. Oh mine. yeah, it is Funny Nemo. Mine, 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 yeah, mine, mine. Yeah, that's like my brain, right? Like I'll be reading something and it's like squirrel A B C D F, and like I read that post, and you posted that right around when we like really started like working together or right before it. And I was like, who are you? Like I was glued. And here's the interesting thing. And I've never told you this. I read it and I couldn't understand the feeling I was having. So I went and read it like five times. And you know, my marketing brain, my copy brain, my customer journey, I was like, what is she doing to me? What sorcery is this? What is this NLP? (laughs) That's but funny. but what was really on the underneath it was that the feeling and the belief I shared, my story was different, but it resonated. It was literally like speaking to my soul and my brain wanted to leave, but it couldn't. And I just, I have to like highlight, I have to let you read this thing because it is so good. And I'm going to preface this. Do you have it up? Yes, have it up. Okay, cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to preface this and I want everybody to really, (laughs) really listen to this because this post moves the mountains and I watch Ashley do these all the time and she helps me with my messaging and everything else. But this one like rocked my world. So listen up and Ashley, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. Before I read it, I'm going to just kind of like talk about my process as to what I do. And I love that you prefaced with what you said, because I bet a thousand bucks you had the exact same thought that I wrote it about. So what I do 
is I, my ideal client, I kind of sit down and I do an entire like brain dump of all of the thoughts I know they have, all the things they've told me, all of the, a lot of times people will say, I feel like blah, 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 right? Like, um, and it's actually a thought. So one thing, one underlying belief that my ideal client had at this point, my ideal client, this is, this is a post that was for um, one of my programs for someone that I don't really serve on that level anymore. I used, I like now kind of work with a higher level. So I will say that. But at the time I was having a lot of people come to me and they would say this or some iteration of this phrase. It's not about the money. I just want to help people. It's not about the money. I just want to help people, which is not bad. Like I want you to understand, like, again, we are here to help people, but because they I have an entire have, rant about that. I have yeah. an entire rant about that, by the way, but yeah, we'll do that in they, podcast too. Perfect. Because they had this, like, it's not about the money. I just want to help people. It was a very conflicting feeling, right? They were putting it in an and, or they're putting it in an either or situation. Either I can make money or I can help people and not putting it in an and situation. So what I do before all of my content, like this is literally the secret, is I literally write down all of their thoughts that they have. And then I say, because they have this thought, what actions are they taking? Or what signs do they have that I can see they're taking because of this thought? So um, in this particular post, I have it up, I'll read it. Um, they, you know, kept saying like, um, it's not about the money. I just want to help people. And then another like kind of underlying thought, I kind of threw two of them together because it was like a branch of this thought was that I can help everyone because they were saying, it's not about the money. I just want to help people. Then one of the actions was they were showing up and trying to help everyone, Right which we know you, you can help everyone, truly you can, but my whole thing is you can't help everyone well. Like you have certain gifts, you have certain talents that fit a very particular person at a very particular point for this, like for people, not, should not be and cannot be for everyone. It can't, right? So those were kind of the two, the two thoughts that were hand in hand when I wrote this post. So. The structure of this post is really honestly just a very simple, everyone's probably heard it if you've been in copywriting, is the PAS, um, which is pain agitation solution. For me, I just did the hook, the pain, um, and then I did the action, or the after, sorry, the after state, then I did the agitation, then I did the solution. So I will read it. That's all I'm going to preface with. So it goes, um, you say you're an expert at what you do. So why are you telling me you can't help me? That's not very Christian of you. Wait, hold the phone. She said what? Yep, that was a response I got one time when I told someone they weren't ready for my one-on-one -on -one offer because I didn't help entrepreneurs at the beginning stages of their business. Here's the truth. I am an expert at what I do. And I do think I really can help everyone, but I can't help everyone the best. That little nugget of wisdom right there is one I see coaches, strategists, and one-on-one -on -one service providers get wrong all the time, even the seven-figure ones I've worked with. It's also one I had to learn the hard freaking way. So then I actually, I'm going to pause right here, and before I go to the rest, one of the actions that I kind of like did, was very strategic with this post, I said, what are some of the actions um, that they would take, right? If someone else, let's say someone else, they, one of their mentors created a program and they thought I can't help everyone, what's the action they would take, right? Like they would end up maybe signing up for these programs that they weren't actually a great fit for and then wondering why they didn't get the results, right? So I kind of strategically put that in this post. So I'll keep going. I just want to preface with that. So then I said, maybe you're like me because again, I've dealt with this too and you've spent so much time and money on the program that or seemed like a perfect fit you did the work but you still didn't get the amazing results like others in the program did you've invested in coaches that said they'd help you with certain things but after a few calls realize their strategies weren't really a great fit and you weren't getting great results like their testimonials raved about what gives right like that's the question we're all like look we did the freaking work why did we not get the results 
Now, I'm not saying these people intentionally do this. And then I threw in, well, unfortunately, some do, but that's another story for another day. But the disconnect is they themselves don't know who is the best fit for their offer and what someone needs to already have in place to make them the best candidate to get maximum results. And this is like one of the main things I help my idle clients with is really digging into what assets their, their idle clients bring to the table, what knowledge, what skills, what do they already have to have in place to make the gap to get your result very small and one they'll actually pay maximum. So I'll keep going. So um, then I said, now you might be saying, that sounds great, Ash, but I already know my ideal client. Um, well, let me challenge you with this. Are all of your clients perfect fit clients who have gotten massive results and super easy to work with? Do you get clients who pay a high ticket price for your offer after only reading two to three pieces of your content? If the answer is no, then I can bet you don't have them or your messaging nailed down enough. So let me just give you a quick example because I'm all about examples of what this looks like. My three month one-on-one -on -one coaching offer digs into four core aspects. The first is setting projections and digging into the data of what is already working in your marketing strategy and business and eliminating what isn't with my list market marketing method. Number two, tweaking and repositioning their validated one-on-one -on -one or group coaching offer to reflect a crystal clear and tangible result. Validated meaning they have actually worked with at least five people who, want, who wanted that offer. Three, mastering your messaging to call out a very specific high ticket client who's a perfect fit for that offer. And then four, implementing a repeatable and scalable marketing strategy to attract those high ticket sales consistently and 99% of the time sign them right in the DMs. Um, and five, as a fun bonus, break through some mindset blocks so that they can give themselves the permission slip to step into their voice and own their freaking amazing self. My clients say this is their favorite part. Marketing, messaging, money, and mindset, my favorite M's. Looking at my offer, you could conclude that this is something a lot of people would see and want. I mean, who doesn't want to have magnetic messaging and attract high ticket clients? But again, not all of them who want it would be a great fit for it. So let's break down the perfect fit person for my offer. So this is where I'm throwing in that solution. Um, and I kind of did it strategically because I'm using my own content as an example. But this is where I throw in kind of my expertise and why I'm different. So I said, my other client needs to have a validated offer, which means that they have so this is needed because it allows me to dig into uh, clients who have already said yes and to pick apart the ones who have gotten better results than the others. Having, by having a validated offer, it also tells me that they already know how to sell, see the value in what they provide, and they aren't um, afraid to show up online and talk about their offer, which is great because I'm not a sales expert. I'm a marketing and messaging expert. These components make step three a breeze because we have actual data on who they should be speaking to and who they have spoken to in the past that haven't been a good fit. They also already know how to write engaging content. They just didn't know what to say in their content. You can market all day long with the messaging is off. You're not going to produce perfect fit leads. And then step four becomes a breeze because I already know they aren't afraid to show up online. They already know they're good at what they do. They already want to charge a high ticket price, aren't afraid to talk about their offer. And when given a simple marketing strategy, they will have no problem being consistent with it because they have a proven track record from step one. And step one also gets simplified the heck down because they now know what to actually focus on and only focus on money-making tasks when it comes to their marketing and business strategy. And bonus, having all this in place puts a little sassy confidence in their pants to show up boldly in their space because they have their stuff nailed down and 100% wholeheartedly believe in what they do. And not to mention creating results like 10K, 20K, 30K plus months, a fully out, a fully booked out month, months and three month wait list. So then I say, do you see how much more clear that is than stating fluff things like my idle client is someone who wants to succeed in their business or is driven and ambitious or is coachable. That could literally be anyone. And the truth is I know who I'm best equipped to help and I don't waste time or money of those who aren't a perfect fit. I don't know about me, but that's an integrity and it's very Christian of me. And then I put PS, if this sounds like you and you want to work together, shoot me a DM and we can chat. And you probably got like 10,000 DMs. Right. Um, I think I got seven DMs for that the first time I posted. And this is something that I tweak and post quite often. So, totally. yeah, it was definitely one that a lot of people resonate with. Something kept coming up for me because one of the things that you've really helped me with is I look like a, a halo angel right now because the sun is coming in a window <laughs> I can't block, but uh, I'm basking in my vitamin D right now on the podcast. Um, 
you know, this thing about like niching down and this has come up over and over. You and I had a private conversation about this today. And you know, it's funny. It's like, I would never get mad that a steakhouse isn't running advertisement to a vegan, but yet I've had resistance to being like, oh, I help X or I help X and, and really mm-hmm. owning it. And, and I'm going to share this because we can unpack this. We probably have like 10 more podcasts in us. So we're going to have to do this. This is part one of blank. I'll let you guys figure out and you decide how many we do, Ashley. But yeah. I, I realize that as we're going through this, like the level of awareness that's brought into our space when we write these posts, mm-hmm. because like I wrote down this thing, it's like, how do you get into their thoughts? How do you get into their actions? But really it requires space intention and empathy right it requires us being like oh man what does that feel like like how are they feeling like what are they saying what are they not saying how are they responding what are they not responding to like paying attention and i feel like one of the mistakes that i see happen all the time is everybody's like i think that's the problem let me fix it fix it fix it fix it oh that didn't work new problem let me fix it fix it fix it and and there's the that Mm -hmm. same thread from earlier in the show the patience game the patience game the patience game. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, I've struggled with resistance to uh, nailing down or quote unquote, niching down messaging. And then it took me a while to unpack the feeling and the belief, but I was addicted to working hard to make seven mm-hmm. figures. And I also had this core wound of fear of success, because if I became successful, then I would have to do the one thing I said I wanted, which was spend my time have my time, have my freedom and have my money. And I didn't know who I was without the work, without the hustle, without the labels. And so then I would like, no, you don't have to, I can serve everybody. And it's like, you can, but I can also specifically serve. And then it's okay too to rotate that. Like, you know, you know, I like there's times I go on podcasts and I'm literally just talking to like e-commerce companies doing 5 million and up that just need one-on-one consulting. And then there's other ones I talk to. It's like just people getting started, but it, all of it requires this level of awareness. And what I love about what you do is it forces perspective, right? Like it really, really forces perspective and awareness. And and to me, it feels like the cheat codes. It really, really feels like the cheat codes to know this and to play this game. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, go ahead. I'll say, I'll add something onto that is that I think people have a different perspective of niching than I do. Yes. And, And because I think people are really niche down for my whole business, right? Like I can only sp- speak to online service-based providers that are ages 30 to 40 who are female women, <laughs> like all this stuff. Like that is not what I consider niching. I consider niching um, specific to, to certain offers that you have, right? And the reason why I do that, because even like what you just said, I have a fear of niching. A lot of the times what happens and what I've realized, especially with you seven figure business owners <laughs> is that you create these huge, huge offers, right? Like I call them Whopper offers. That's like something I've totally coined is a Whopper offer. And then you do get a lot of people interested in it, but then a lot of people don't get results. Like some of them don't get the most amazing results that you know they could have gotten. And then you know that like, yeah, they might have not taken the action or not nothing, but then you actually put it on yourself a little bit. Like you're kind yeah. of like, well, I didn't do enough or, um, you know, or like you get frustrated a little bit of being like, I know that this is amazing. Why are not all these people getting results? Right. And so it's, it's not even like they've complained or they've done anything. It's just you as a person of integrity, you want every person who buys your offer to get you what you know they're possible of getting. Will right? you stop coaching me? So Will you like, please just stop coaching <laughs> right now? <laughs> but seriously, like it is, um, it's very true, right? Because I realize that, I mean, a lot of the, the, the higher level people that I work with, you guys are so much integrity and you want, like you truly, truly want everyone in your space to get what you know they're capable of getting. But a lot of times people don't have certain things in place and you need to know that. So when I say niching, I mean, you need to niche down to a very, very, very specific person for that particular offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I say niche, you need to know what assets they already have in place. Like as in, what do they already own? So for example, I'll use Ashley DeLuca because we talked about her earlier, email marketing strategist. 
Her offer is helping people with the tech back end and writing emails for them. Mm -hmm. An asset for her ideal client is someone who's already going to have an email list of either 500 and plus. They're probably already going to have open rates of over 50%. They're already going to have a validated offer that they that someone's bought over and over and over again, right? Like they're already going to know their ideal client. They're already going to have a huge pool of content they've created for other avenues and other platforms that will make Asha DeLuca's job way easier, right? She'll know, oh my gosh, I can just take all the content they've already created, put them in some emails. I know what offer I'm selling. I know exactly what the their price point is for this offer. They know who their idol client is. Like it's perfect, right? That is knowing your idol client specifically. Another is also breaking down their knowledge, right? Their knowledge. What do you know? is not going to go out there and say email marketing is not dead. Her idol client already knows email marketing is not dead, right? Like she's not going to be screaming that. She's not going to put a low level mentality on a high level client, mm -hmm. right? She's not going to be out there yelling and saying things that they already know. And that's a huge mistake I see in marketing is that a lot of the times people come to me and they're like, I'm getting leads. I'm good at creating content, but I'm not getting perfect fit leads, I'm getting people to tell me I can't afford that, or I'm not at that level yet, right? Um, or if they do buy it and they're not a good fit, they start to come to your offer with a scarcity mindset because their thought is, I just paid a lot of money, this has to work, oh my goodness, if it doesn't work, I'm a failure, right? And so they come with that thought, then their feeling is a feeling of scarcity, so then they come with these actions of doing all of these things, right? And they might become a pain in the rear and client for you. Um, or you know, then they might complain if they did all this action and didn't get results, right? So you have to know, you, they have to have, you have to know what their knowledge is. What do they already know, right? They already know content is valuable, right? They're using Ashley Delucas. They already know content is valuable. They already know how to sell. That's another thing too. And knowing how to actually carry on a communication because if Ashley DeLuca is creating emails to draw leads, if they get these leads and they don't close them, who do you think they're going to, they're going to blame? They're going to blame Ashley DeLuca saying you brought in horrible leads, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't get sales. You brought in horrible leads. No, she didn't do that. Right. She brought you leads. You just couldn't, you couldn't sell. Again, an example. So you need another asset. So you know, their knowledge. Um, and also assets are also resources. I say resources as well, like in conjunction. Um, and then skills, like what do they already know how to do? Like, what do they already know to do? Do they already know how um, to create content? Do they already know how to go live and talk about their offer? Do they already know how to run a challenge? That's another thing that would be great for Ashley DeLuca's idle client to have, right? Because she's creating emails. If she's creating a sales email, it'd be really cool if they already knew, already had the skill on creating a challenge and putting all that together. Because then that, key, that she could create five emails right off the bat that goes along with that challenge super easy. So you need other assets or skills. So when I say niching, niching down, that is what I mean. I mean, niching down to a very specific person that already has certain things in place for your particular offer. It's not like entrepreneurs online for your entire business. When I think niching, I think for specific offer, because George, you could have an offer that is specific for e-commerce. You could have an offer like your mastermind that is specific for online business entrepreneurs, right? Like you can have that, you can have that, um, but you need to know who's going to be a great fit for whatever you're offering in that offer. And I also will say like the knowledge that I already know, also the mindset things. What are some of the mindset things they've already come over? My idle client is over the mindset drama of I can't raise my prices. Mm -hmm. My idle client already has a high ticket offer. I don't want to deal with someone who's like, I don't feel like I'm good enough to charge a high ticket price. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that mindset. It's a lot harder for me to get them to where they want or the result that I know my offer can get them if they already have that mindset. So they already know that my offers were worth a high ticket price and I'm charging a high ticket price for it. So that's what I mean by niching. I wanted to like say that. And a lot of people do not get down to that specific. They just think like, oh, a female entrepreneur who... <laughs> Yeah, makes you know five thousand dollars a year and is ages thirty to thirty five and drives a drives a Honda Civic and has two kids. Like, yeah, that doesn't matter at all. So yeah. no, and I appreciate. No, I love it. I love that you unpack that, and I appreciate some of the things that you said because I've cried to you about like the integrity that I have. I'm like, 
and you're like, just get a little bit more specific. But like one of the things that you're talking about is like when you protect your queen bee role and your skill set while also protecting the client that comes in, like you increase the likelihood of maximum results on both sides. And there's levels to this game and, and it, and it's true. I mean, like the Whopper, the Whopper offer, I mean, I've done it. Like I've, I've had, oh man, I've had Everyone's experience. Done. I've had experience in all of this and, and like you're speaking to my soul. Like I feel incredibly safe right now because you're on my team and in my world and uh, it's, it's validating, but it's also really awakening and it's just another awareness of like, Oh yeah, look, that's what I'm supposed to do. Like, Oh, I'm supposed to be specific. I don't have to niche down. Like I only sell to moms and minivans, but like, please don't sell me Lululemon leggings, but I'll take their yoga shorts because they're comfortable, right? Like they have different products. They have different offers. They have different messaging, They all fit under the umbrella and the ethos of the company, but they have to adapt to who they're speaking to when they're speaking. And all of it goes back to intention. It all goes back to intention. And so I love it. I feel like we should put a pretty bow on this episode and then we should keep open loops for the next one. Yeah. And the last thing that I do want to share that was on that last mind wave of mine is that a lot of the times too, um, entrepreneurs get stuck like that's in that same mindset of well they're asking me for help so I'm I'm just gonna help them and for me I really had to change my thought around the fact that when I'm helping someone that I know I can't 100% help like maybe only 80% help I'm robbing somebody else of that opportunity and that privilege and I think that is so incredibly unfair um because I would never want someone to do that. And of course I've had clients come to me and are like, Oh, I work with this, 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 and this. And I knew like who that coach was. And I'm like, they don't help with that. Like, you know, type thing. And like, it made me feel bad because I'm like, darn, like this, my client has now wasted thousands of dollars working with someone that I'm not saying was a complete waste of time or waste of money by any means, but they weren't a perfect fit to help with that specific problem that they had. And I think, Again, on the awareness, you as an entrepreneur, knowing exactly what problem you solve for someone and sticking to that in a one specific offer, right? In a specific offer, um, it puts you automatically in integrity. Because when I tell people no, when I tell them you're not a great fit for my offer, they stick around like bees to honey because they're like, oh my gosh, I've never had someone like they're so used to be getting sold to and coached on a call and basically trying to be convinced that they, you know, they should buy their offer. When I tell you how to fit, their minds are blown. They're like, oh my gosh, thank you for not taking my money when you know I wasn't a good fit for it. And then I'll say, yes, but here are the few things you can do to be a good fit if you were interested in working with me down the line. I have so many people who are like, working with Ashley Fernandez is on my goal list. I'm working through the things that I need to get to get to the level to be able to work with you, right? So I want to say that too, that I had to change that mindset of when I'm working with someone who is not a perfect fit for me, I am robbing some other person the opportunity to work with them. I'm doing myself, the client, and that other person that is a perfect fit for them a disservice. And to me, like, I just would never want that to happen to me. So I never want to do that to somebody else, but I did have to change my mindset around that. I love it. No, I mean, and it's a really, really important thread. I mean, it's when you're, you know, when you're a professional athlete, when you're Tom Brady, like you're doing yourself a disservice. Like I want to get better at football, but I'm going to go play baseball today and get upset that I didn't win the Super Bowl. Right. Like you nailed it. Okay. So I got some rapid fire ones, beach or mountains. Oh, mountains, hands down. Yeah, you should see the ones out my window, Ashley. I don't know why you guys don't live in Montana yet. I don't know why you guys don't live in Montana yet. Like those snow-capped mountains over here. They're amazing. Mountains all day. (laughs) Okay, we know your favorite pastime is talking about farting. You and Angie have some spirit animals together, right? What's your favorite food? Ooh, um, favorite food... I love sushi, like anything and all sushi, which is kind of random because I would so rather be the mount- mountains than the beach. Um, so I would say, I would say sushi. Yeah, what do you, sushi. what do you order when you get sushi? Ooh, honestly, I like just take, like anytime I go to a, a sushi restaurant, I just honestly pick something different. Like I have to try very, very, um, 
I'm one of those people who like really loves to try different foods that I've never tried before. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to actually want to be like a food blogger, which is really funny because you used to be <laughs> one. And I, I blogged and I had a lifestyle blog and I used to do recipes. Um, but anyways, I, I love, I love to try different things. So honestly, anything like I don't have just favorite things. I like to try all different things. Are you, so food. you're like, you're, you're not particular like rolls or sashimi. You're like anything new, anything new. I okay. want to try it. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, what are you currently reading? Oh, I am currently reading the little book of clarity. Oh, you listen. And I see the catalyst behind I you. Listened. I'm currently reading that. I will say you mentioned Jim quick earlier. And I just want to say that he is the man who changed my life with reading because I do read like a book a week mm. because of the speed reading course that I took of his. Um, I was like, oh my God, yes, I love, and I love that every video he has a brain on his yep. shirt and I'm like, I should totally, totally like vibe with him with this brain thing. So anyways, yeah. Um, he is the reason why I read a book a week, but I am currently, I'm almost done. I probably have about 10, 15 pages left Got of it. Little Book of Clarity. Yeah. Jim, Jim's an amazing human being and a friend. I'm excited to have him on the podcast next week. Um, and I'm then favorite business book you've ever read. Ooh. Oh God, that's a hard one. Um, so the catalyst is really good, which you recommended to mm-hmm. me. Um, the one thing was mm-hmm. very pivotal for me because it made me just simplify the heck down. Um, I'm looking at, hold on, I'm gonna look at my shelf. I'm like, I got books over here. Um, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind was really, really good. Um, let me see. I'm looking. I have like some good ones, but she's one better here. Um, I might say I might leave it at those. I'll I might leave it, leave it at those. Okay, yeah. we can leave it at those. Okay. Last time, last thing, everybody listening, you get one. To, oh, wait, nope, two things, two things. Got to open my own loop. Where the hell can everybody find you, Ashley Fernandez? Oh, yes. Where everyone can find me. Um, I'm not in all the places. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Facebook group. Yep. I have a Facebook group called the leaders table. It is. A um, that's group. mostly where I spend. Yep. That's where I spend most of my time. Um, so my Facebook group, um, I am on Instagram, but I don't really interact on Instagram. Um, so I don't even want to, you can find me Ashley May Fernandez, but, uh, I don't really spend a lot of time on Instagram, but usually it is just my, my, uh, book Facebook. Faces. Book of Faces, and you can always add me as a friend on there too. So um, I do like talk about my business and stuff on my personal page. So yeah, you guys can go find my profile too if it's easier to spell. She's friends, just search my friends. And her, by the way, I got to give her kudos. I got to give her kudos. It's Ashley May Fernandez, but she has the best welcome posts of anybody I've ever seen in her Facebook group. Oh, yeah. I recommend people join the group just for the Facebook welcome messages. Okay, so now I have the last thing. You could tattoo okay. anything on anybody's souls. Like what's the last thing you want to leave people with? What do you want them to remember? What do you want them to think? What do you want them to do? I'm not going to hold you to one breath, but like last mm-hmm. message, they're going to end this. Like, what do you want to give people? Mm. I knew you were going to ask this question because I know you ask everyone and I was debating and I'm like, I'm not quite sure. Um, I will say something that I say all the time is don't turn souls into sales. Mm. Don't turn souls into sales. That is something that I have embrained in my mind is this person is a soul. And I think, you know, going off of what we talked about today is stop letting blind people for your vision. Like really you need to figure out 100% who you are, who you feel called to serve, what you're put on this planet to do, what your calling is and really honestly stick to that in your vision. Um, And at the end of the day, if it feels like you are out of alignment with that, be aware of it. Like always be in self-awareness. And I think that's something you really drilled into my brain too, George is always, always, always being self-aware. So yeah, I I think I love it. Stop Always being self aware even when I don't want to be. And I'm like a whiny little baby, like throwing a temper tantrum because I'm like, I don't want to be aware right now. But it's true. 
It's true. And I swear, Fernandez, this is the tweetable of the year. Stop letting blind people proofread your vision. That is a takeaway. Yeah. I would tattoo that on everybody's soul. So we will get another one scheduled because we're going to have to do round two. I'm sure we'll figure out what to talk about. And yes, thank you so much for being here. For everybody listening, this has been another episode of the Mind of George. So remember that relationships will always be the algorithm. So I will either see you in the next episode or you will hear me in your earballs. But now it's time to cue the outro. Yay! Good job. <laughs>